Welcome everybody to tonight's event, Regard Croisé at Mudam, on the exhibition of Leono Antunes, which is currently in show in the pavilion of Mudam. We are very glad to share tonight uh, our conversation with you, actually on six terms, about an hexagonal pavilion with Antunes sculptures. You might see if you are online or if you are in the audience room, two screens with the exhibition room, or you might attend being in the exhibition. So you will see the exhibition in real time, but only listening to both of us, which will be fine. Anyhow. Um, Milica Topalovic joined our session from Zurich where she currently works and lives with her family. Milica is researcher and teacher in architecture and territorial planning at ETH since about 15 years, currently associate professor at the ETH Zurich after having spent for about four years between 11 and 15 in Singapore in the Future City Laboratory. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you for being here too. So today, Dora, she's um, dancing, performing as a response to our conversation by her movements in the pavilion. Thank you, Dora. <laughs> Myself, I'm Carol Schmidt. I'm an architect living and working in Luxembourg. For 15 years, I have been leading an architecture office called Polaris together with my partner, Francois. Currently, I am teaching at the university in Luxembourg in the Master in Architecture, next to my project leading um, job at the Administration of Public Works. So our conversation should last for about one hour and it will be packed into six sections, six terms. Um, we will spend approximately 10 minutes on each term. Okay, now we start with the first term, which is about generation. So I just make a brief introduction. Um, Milica and myself, actually, we met at the end of the 90s in Amsterdam at the research lab, which was called Berlag Institute, um, where we studied together for about two years. I was belonging to Generation 9. And Milica, she was actually belonging to generation 10. In the meantime, there have been 30 generations being graduated. And so um, we are very happy actually to share today this idea that we belong to the same generation, actually the same as Leonor Antunes, which is also born or at least was a child during the 70s as we were. So maybe Milica, you, you, you can, Tell us a little bit how it was growing up in Belgrade in the 70s. <laughs> yes, thank you, Carol. <laughs> so, uh, so it was uh, interesting to discover as we met actually, and and uh, I think used the opportunity to 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 uh, encounter each other once again and. Um, uh, let's say uh, revisit our friendship after after many years. And one of the first uh, things we we understood was uh, was that Leonor basically um, is the same generation. And I think we we began to wonder: is there uh, something that um, creates a kind of a shared experience among us? Let's say what separates a generation of the 70s and does does this experience of let's say growing up in the 70s um, um, bring us together or or create a kind of similar worldview or or a value system that we that we share to this day and um so so we decided to <laughs> speak a little bit about the 70s and uh, and in preparation i i uh I started to to think back to that time. Well, I can tell you that I uh, grew up in Belgrade in a in a socialist country, <laughs> uh, 
called Yugoslavia at the time uh, in a street that was actually called Boulevard of Yuri Gagarin. This uh, betrays a kind of a proximity to uh, to the Soviet bloc. So I'm, we are also children of a Cold War. I mean, if we are looking at the kind of shared memories and experiences. Um, I remember, of course, modern architecture. This is one of the, the resonances to, to the work of Leonor and Tunis. I mean, modern architecture, modern space, which uh, uh, kind of created the framework of the daily lives at the time new apartment, new appliances, uh, new uncomfortable furniture, <laughs> new modern school, uh, new children playground, uh, etc., new landscape, new trees, and so on. I remember technology, um, good TV, uh, radio that let's say, dominated our life. I mean, in comparison to, to, to Dora, who is tonight with us, um, no fixed phones, no internet, no computers in the daily life. So let's say we have, we have those memories, right? We have the, the memories of, of uh, different kind of communication. Um, I think we were also raised with environmental teams. Um, I think the, the acid rain, the depletion wasn't layer back then. So uh, let's say those are the things that, that resonate still, I think, in a, in a different way. Perhaps I would say we were raised with, or I remember distinctly economic crisis. I remember power blackouts. I remember um, rationing. I remember driving on odd and even um, numbers uh, uh, according to, to license plate numbers. Um, I remember, um, let's say, I mean, we would say today probably rising Thatcherism as a kind of a broad political phenomenon that, that originates in the um, uh, late in the times of economic crisis, I remember punk movement very distinctly in that, you know, in that to say so modern space. And um, I remember having more time, everybody having more time, you know, more time to waste, to, to, to do nothing and so on. So, so how was it, how was it growing up in Luxembourg? Well, I believe that uh even uh, though I was in a, in a non-socialist country, uh, growing actually up in a very conservative landscape, um, uh, which was strongly run by um, still Catholic socialist parties, um, I had a very similar um, feel about that time. Um, actually, my, my city was a small city, was not the capital, and um, but it belonged to the industrial part of our country where there was steel uh, being produced. And uh, the landscape I saw from my balcony, because I lived in an apartment, was actually gray because the fine dust would, you know, be constantly reproduced. And so I was growing up in pollution, in heavy pollution. Um, of course, um, uh, I remember very well also the the upraise of the punk culture, um, you know. But I, when I was small, I, I didn't really set it back into a historical <laughs> moment. I just saw these guys, these youngsters, you know, having these funny uh, <laughs> hair, and and you know these the, the new type of music uh, popping up indeed and uh, other ways of dressing and it was this new future you know generation actually that uh, that we were belonging to um, in my particular case I I didn't um, I wasn't introduced into a very bourgeois milieu I, I grew up actually basically in an environment where there were many workers kids next to kids from engineers basically um, so it was in a way um, colorful and homogeneous at the same time um, but it, it really had a great impact on my perception of cities because um, I, I, I still um, have a lot of uh, sympathy 
towards these industrial <laughs> environments and landscapes. They do not represent this classic beauty of historical city centers or something like that, but they had this you know, roughness, but also um, um, potential, right, which was already there. So that, that, that was actually basically the landscape I, I grew up, you know, at the same time. Yeah. But then it's it's interesting, perhaps, to remember uh, uh, our generation at the Berlach, right? So we yes. we we were together in the in the master studies, and I think we we shaped again a kind of a generational approach to architecture, isn't isn't that right? I, I I believe so. Yes, I I, I very much remember that <laughs> in the nineties um, there was these you know, huge um, happiness of, of, of getting borders open, right? Well, this was basically the part in, in Western part of Europe, maybe less. But since you were in Amsterdam, I, I believe you could enjoy um, this too. And yeah, um, so. yes, yes. So th that that actually raised a lot of hope in our minds. I, I remember this, this border issue became something really, really important um, on one hand. And then the other thing, which is, I think, very strongly related to our generation um, was about uh, the transdisciplinary, the, the, the raise of new media and technologies, which would, you know, um, completely reshape our way of, of designing and thinking architecture basically and so we we had a lot of discussions on how to use them you know the ones that were really enthusiastic and the other ones were maybe less enthusiastic you know i remember um, that, that, Jerry... was, that was uh, that was a real uh, that was a real debate right it, it was. was like kind of how to approach technology and i think there were kind of kind of um, uh, let's say tech architects among us, you know, those that embrace complexity and, uh, and you know, the, the kind of uh, aesthetics of this kind of technological design, uh, parametric design, and those that, uh, you know, that, that kind of held back from all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Which we, I remember Pierre Vittorio uh, writing and presenting his manifesto against Photoshop and yes. you know, this was a really great, great moment in the audience, you know, because Photoshop was a, such a solitary, you know, tool. You were all so happy. <laughs> and he kind of, yeah, well, maybe we should talk about matter now. Exactly. The second, uh, second term is matter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's um, good. So, 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 you know, it came immediately, right? So, so Leonor's work is about matter, about material. It's also mm -hmm. about details, right? So it's in a way, it's very architectural. It's, it's refined in its construction, in its, in its making, no? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's such a strong feeling when, when you enter her installations full of sculptures full of perfection actually and which embrace you you know in such a calm and serene it, it it's it's extremely um um actually uh serene uh in in its appearance and i believe that what um what, what she what she tried to achieve is to to show the beauty and the simplicity of all these materials by using craft. So I, I just, if you agree, I, I just would like to, to read a very small abstract um, extract of a book um, which um, has been written by Queen Latima, mm -hmm. um, where she made a collection of essays and poems. And, and there is one about, about Leonor and it's beautiful. I can't read it completely, but I, I just offer a very, very small insight. It says, in the Kunsthalle Basel exhibition poster for Antunas exhibition, the sepia-tinged image shows a courtyard enclosed by walls and trees and leaves and light, a kind of pavilion. 
A woman mates, waits there like a traveler might wait for a train. If she, as a traveler, though she is also an artist. I do not remember seeing a post of Antunes exhibition, Sculptures for Traveling, at the Kunstverein Harburger Bahnhof in Hamburg. Let's imagine one together. A glass pavilion, a flood of travelers, a sign that reads club. Inside the narrow glass walls, an artist unpacking her suitcase, laying out her materials on the floor. Leather, light, brass, wood, rope, silence, distance. She begins to assemble them at last. So this text actually is extracted out of this book and is called The Artist in Tunis, or Last Words on the Last Days of Sculptures for Traveling. Mm -hmm. Actually, the author visited her pavilion and being there, she, she got inspired and she found room and space for her own um, poetry. So I, I, uh, I have... Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the, with the text as well, and uh, I was really struck uh, with this comparison of uh, artist uh, with the traveler. And yeah. I had actually been thinking whether uh, traveling uh, is a metaphor for, for any kind of artist or traveler is a metaphor for any kind of artist or, or perhaps uh, specifically to, to a, uh, a woman artist. <laughs> uh, and I was wondering to what extent, um, um, you know, I mean, traveling certainly is, uh, is um, um, a kind of a, <laughs> to say so, demand of contemporary art. But uh, I think uh, um, in in the case of of Leonor, uh, I am I am rather fascinated by the the kind of transience and the kind of lightness of of the of the gesture, right, and of the yeah. uh, let's say details and the the, the procedures which I. I relate to the kind of a um, um, feminine or perhaps feminist design uh, experiences. Yeah, no. yeah. it definitely yes, sh certainly is. M maybe there's another another thing which which strikes me a lot is about the the fact that she uses pure material in a way. You know, this kind of honesty and and authenticity of the material which which are reworked, you know, and we worked in a very sophisticated and yet simple way. Um, and almost as opposed to this Western tend, trend in culture to, to mix and blend materials again and again in order to develop the most sophisticated technologies until they finally become mm -hmm. unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, you know, I believe that, you know, these these materials, when they become so sophisticated and um, that one cannot see really what it is anymore, the mm -hmm. chance of getting it back in the new circle of, of, of views is, is very limited, mm -hmm. even though physically speaking, it's, it's always possible, right? So, and I, I think she... she she has really a stand with it, you know. This is sort of an, an, a, a very maybe female resistance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. against this trend, you know, of of um, anti ecological way of using materials. <laughs> I don't yeah, know how kind to... of composite composite against composite materials. Let's yes. say, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I, I think this is something at least which which comes out. Um, but nevertheless, the, the poetry is maybe 
you know, is even stronger, you know, is even. And I, I believe that that maybe leads us to the next to the next term, because I, I, I think we can make a transition to to chance. Um, being in, in, in Antonis exhibition, um, I feel um, relieved. I feel space for interpretation and freedom, actually, freedom of movement, freedom of thought. Um, and this um, is maybe something which um, makes me think about the term of chance, you know, because it's, an, it's, it's chance as an opportunity, but it's also chance as something which you cannot control and which is which possibly can happen. So I, I'm, I just want to refer maybe to, to this physician, you know, um, as, a, as a small provocation, Jean Cavaillès, he, he was a physician um, uh, who died actually during the Second World War as a resistant. Mm -hmm. But just before dying, he published a last publication and um, where he was actually stating that there is no mathematical definition of chance. Mm -hmm. So for him, there is a scientific certitude of being able to cover all and everything into rules and knowledge. You know, he says, actually, I, I can, I can offer this quote. It's in French. Il n'y a pas de définition mathématique du hasard. Le dernier sens du hasard, c'est l'ignorance. Dire qu'une suite est due au hasard, c'est affirmer qu'on ne pourra pas trouver de loi mathématique pour la succession de ces termes. And this is typically, you know, the stand of Western culture, I, I believe, where, where there is a very strong faith into solving all and everything by rules, mm -hmm. by, by equations maybe, and where the knowledge, of course, belongs to the strong mm -hmm. and, and gives a lot of power as well. Whereas um, maybe mm -hmm. in other cultures, one would find um, the potential of, of the hazard, of the chance, you know, mm -hmm. chance of, of the unexpected, you know. And um, maybe I just stop and, and just refer then maybe to, to Stéphane Mallarmé, who wrote... Uh, in 1897, un coup de déjà n'abolira le hasard. And where he said, and this is French again, I'm sorry for this, but I, I, he says, actually, it's also about numbers and chance. He says, c'était le nombre issu stellaire, exista-t-il autrement qu'hallucination et parse d'agonie? Commença-t-il et cessa-t-il, sourdant que nié et clos quand apparu enfin? par quelque profusion répandue en rareté, se chiffra-t-il Évidence de la somme, pour peu qu'une illumina-t-il, ce serait pire, non, davantage, ni moins, mm -hmm. indifféremment, mais autant, le hasard. <laughs> so, what, what about chance, you know, mm -hmm. what do you think? I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating let's say as uh, as uh, as designers and architects right so i think we are um we are familiar with that um let's say creative process that very often involves chance right but in ways that are not apparent no in in the finished product and i think this is interesting when when looking at leonor's work that you know, to both of us, the term chance came across very strongly because we we wondered about the process and to what extent the kind of a um, uh, uh, let's say control or what 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 is what is the logic? What are what are to say so the rules behind it, right? And I uh, I also um, I mean this kind of creative rules, right? And to 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 explain that. Uh, I have this uh, uh, example that I I, um, I liked very much. I remember in the student days. So there was this book uh, uh, published, I think, also in the late 70s by by uh, Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt. So it was a kind of artistic collaboration that was discovered accidentally, where they developed independently from each other 
cards to to help them in a way orchestrate or 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 bring in chance or a kind of possibility to decide in the creative process when you know when things get difficult let's say and the cards are fascinating because uh, i think um, i think perhaps every every designer to say so every artist uh, in in a broad sense i mean i i mean also architects and musicians and so on work with those uh, uh, to say so individually developed rules and I, I some some of the cards that are very entertaining and I think we recognize them like this card in axiom no mm-hmm. I remember that but... <laughs> <laughs> Let's get, get rid of the main idea right yeah. or repetition as a form of change right embrace repetition or uh, distorting time no mm-hmm very interesting also architecturally what you know what what might happen or destroy nothing this is a fascinating one no, nobody will tell you that in architecture school right or destroy the most important thing on the other hand you know you you hear your teachers so often you know don't don't be don't be uh, don't be sentimental right change your project right and and so on or or you know be dirty and and so on you know like like you know pollute the canon and so on. And I think this was this, uh, this uh, uh, a, a certain, certain um, elegance about Leonor's work is, is there, which, which uh, uh, the, um, you know, it, it is not easy to say so to read in terms of a creative process, right? So we, 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 were, we were to say so both, uh, both wondering on the, on the element of chance. Exactly. And uh, I think, I mean, I think, of course, the, the kind of uh, 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 chance, I mean, that also extends back to, to the question of matter and to the kind of a male and female, to say so, strategies in, in terms of handling form, right, and handling material uh, uh, are, are, you know, I mean, there, there's a, say, so fascinating uh, histories and examples. I mean, your your favorite is is John Cage. <laughs> if you want to yeah. speak, <laughs> you try to. No, no. Yes, I, I of course, John Cage. Uh, um, you know, of course, there is this. Um, you know, his chance, you know, control chance operation mechanisms is something which fascinates me for for many many years, and uh, but. But of course, I'm not the only one. You know, there was this beautiful um, um, exhibition recently at Mudam uh, about uh, Maurice's work, who'd been also actually um, who was uh, actually actively engaged uh, with Cage about about these mechanisms. Mm-hmm. So um, no, no, of course, I I think that um, there is another dimension which I I think due to time I would like to to maybe to switch over Milica if we could go and and I think you want to say something about nature which is also very present in in Leonor's work maybe. Well, um, yeah, I mean, wh- why? Uh, okay, let's uh, let me let me try to to explain why why was nature important. Um, uh, well, I think uh, uh, um, nature. Let's say as uh, um, uh, I mean. We've we've uh, we've uh, encountered Eleanor restoration, and wa- one of the terms was nature. And obviously, I think there's a kind of certain dedication to nature through through material, right? Yes. So let's say through the choice of material, and also through um, through the craft or through the through the handcraft. Um, there is, a, I think, modernism uh, is is uh, let's say. Uh, uh, present as a kind of a aesthetic sensibility, but I think also the kind of nostalgia, which is, you know, exists nostalgia for the kind of pre-modern craft traditions, which are absorbed, you know, in modern architecture, modern art, uh, you know, over, over uh, 
um, uh, through, through various, to say so, artistic uh, trajectories. And um, I, uh, uh, I, uh, I think that that uh, um, uh, the, I mean, uh, I would I would perhaps refer to in opening this uh, this uh, kind of uh, wide and uh, I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, difficult theme of nature. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think what is perhaps interesting to say that, um, um, you know, we, we live, I think, in a time when uh, we are perhaps in the moment when we uh, have to reconsider or where we are in the process of reconsidering uh, the kind of wide cultural perspective of, on nature, no? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, if we talk about Anthropocene, I think we talk about uh, basically about exhaustion of, of worldviews <laughs> and <laughs> uh, the worldviews imply the kind of uh, 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 relationship of the human society towards um, the the world ecology or or nature right and uh, the kind of unpacking the history of nature is a, is a difficult and I, can, I think fascinating exercise and uh, I think this is also where Leonor's work resonates right because this kind of clear and committed um, uh, let's say handling of materials and perhaps touching this point where you know the modern or the progressive can can be in contact with you know the natural or perhaps let's call it sustainable <laughs> you know this is this is a kind of a very very um, um, I think sensitive point for you know for I would say, if, you know, for, for not only architects, but for, you know, civilization in general, Everybody. right? I mean, can we, can we design architecture, which is, you know, emission free, which is uh, not about, um, you know, reinforced concrete or, or other to say so, uh, you know, technologies, composite materials, as you said, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, there is this, uh, I mean, there are, I think, I mentioned uh, I, I, I wanted to open up this topic of the history of nature, and one one book in particular was uh, interesting. Uh, Caroline Merchant, um, a philosopher and uh, also feminist writer, in the 1980s, uh, came up with a book, "Death of the Death of Nature: Women, Ecology, and the Scientific Revolution," and what is so she precisely tries to do this kind of a sweeping history where, where her thesis is that actually uh, the shifting view of nature is a, is a historic process and she traces it back approximately 300 years and she says there is a, a, a 300 year old uh, roughly uh, shift in uh, from seeing the earth as a living organism towards seeing it as a machine mm -hmm. that was consequently used to justify uh, uh, industrial capitalism mm -hmm. and uh, domination of, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah. of both nature and women in, in her perspective. So she says <laughs> the exploration of images and metaphors directly linking nature and women she in this uh, in this book she uh, um, uh, in fact debates these changing attitudes towards science and technology mm -hmm. and um, the history I think what is fascinating is that history begins uh, uh, with the discovery of the new world the late 15th century and um, um, uh, you know, goes through through an um, a incredible number of examples from, you know, Newton to, to Leibniz, uh, uh, through which in, in, in her uh, uh, 
point of view, this me mechanistic uh, world uh, uh, worldview was was installed, and um, um, a couple of um, um, I think um, I you know a couple of um, I mean where it where it uh, leads to uh, you know bringing us today uh, to to the to the present day I think we we are. Uh, uh, still, I, I would say, completely entrenched in that discussion. I mean, if we look, for instance, uh, on the work of uh, um, Bruno Latour in uh, in Facing Gaia, we have, uh, you know, practically the same kind of uh, question mark uh, uh, presented in the book. So, uh, um, basically. Uh, uh, is it uh, possible to, uh, let's say, uh, reconfigure our uh, 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 cultural paradigms around nature in order to, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, gradually uh, begin uh, <laughs> kind of modifying uh, uh, other other fields of um, uh, uh, activity, you know, from uh, politics to economy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, uh, the the notion, of course, which is also implicated is is Gaia, and there is a link to to James Lovelock. So, uh, so let's say, uh, is it possible to um, uh, I think uh, to to say it in a provocative uh, terms, but these are also Latourian terms. Is it Possible to 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 remember or under under our conditions uh, uh, reinstall a kind of a new natural <laughs> religion that would uh, uh, let's say uh, inform uh, the kind of uh, uh, shift that that we are uh, looking for in the yeah. in the face of let's say environmental global environmental uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a big question. I think it, it yeah. leads us to, to the idea of progress, right? That's what we need. We need um, we need to to address progress now because I believe it's a matter of civilization, maybe where we can find some you know you know hints hints um, also in the history where 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 Western civilization became a kind of one religion for for. The whole planet in a way you know about um um it's um almost arrogance to pretend uh, being able to to conduct society through scientific knowledge certain governance you know and the economy which goes with it and the, of course the how to say that centralization of capital among a few, you know, which has been you now um, delivering for several centuries. Um, whereas when we look, you know, if we really look to the way how things are built, maybe we can learn something. If we, I, I just, you know, maybe I can just um, give you the example of a, a Shinto shrine, you know, in Japan. Mm -hmm. which is something which is repeatedly, it, it's a shrine, mm -hmm. which is repeatedly turned down and rebuilt actually every 20 years. And this over the past 1,300 years. So what happens is that um, uh, the Shinto belief um, is based on, on the fact that they believe into the death and the renewal of nature and, and the impermanence of all the things and as a way of passing building technologies, actually, from one generation to the other. Um, and this is a whole process which occurs every 20 years. So which means that one single person in this community has most possibly the chance to, to learn about rebuilding this shrine for mm -hmm. two or three times. Mm -hmm. So, if we look at Japanese culture, mm -hmm. um, we we do discover this, you know, um, uh, belief into into tradition and the knowledge which goes with it. Mm -hmm. We see it in the way how they handle craft, how they handle certain 
building materials. Mm -hmm. But we also see that they have no trouble of going with the new technologies as well. So mm -hmm. there is not this dialectical view on either or, right? Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. have this capacity to embrace mm -hmm. the whole history in a way. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and stay connected with nature. So they don't oppose nature as something which is you have the mm -hmm. you have the humankind and you have the nature. No, actually humankind belongs to nature, is nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I uh, yeah I love uh, I love the I love the example of Shinto shrine and uh, it uh, it actually reminded me of of John Berger, and uh, I think uh, m most of many, I think probably everybody in the audience will will know uh, John Berger for for one one or another of his uh, uh, books or or um, uh, the ways of seeing. Uh, Berger uh, actually, uh, there is a there is a biographical moment which was deeply fascinating to me. So. Uh, uh, somewhere in the mid 70s so again we are back in the 70s he actually left london where he was born and he uh, moved to uh, french savoie uh, close to geneva to a very small village a hamlet about 50 kilometers uphill from geneva and uh, in his uh, um, uh, testament in his writing, uh, the motive uh, was to, to document the disappearance of subsistence farming. No? So the, the experience of um, historical experience, let's say, of, of peasantry, uh, that uh, he believed was uh, drawing to a historical close and he was to, to bear witness to this vanishing existence. And, and uh, there, um, there are, uh, I mean, there is a very, very rich writing by him on this period. There are, there are also films documenting him in this environment. Uh, uh, I think the seasons in Quincy uh, highly recommended, uh, featuring also Tilda Swinton. And uh, uh, so one of the, one of the uh, uh, arguments that Berger makes in, the, in this uh, uh, opus is that um, uh, I think similarly to your Shinto Shrine, let's see, we should be looking closely and kind of salvaging these traditions because uh, uh, it's precisely according to him, among other things, about the, the notion of progress. So he says that um, uh, with this commitment to, to living on the earth, peasant has a different worldview uh, then urban classes and notably the proletariat. So all urban classes also kind of including the bourgeoisie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so let's say the, the, the peasantry uh, cultivates uh, uh, what he calls the culture of survival and that is opposed to the culture of progress. And he describes the difference through the understanding of time. And he says that peasant has a cyclic view of time that is based on seasonality, nature's rhythms and so on, that is opposed to the kind of linear time, which, is, which has a kind of a upward trajectory towards some, uh, to say so, future horizon, however it is projected. And he says, by contrast, peasant is oriented to the past, not to the future. And he says his primary state of justice, so this is a quote, quite uh, interesting formulation, primary state of justice is the past before the onset of injustice where that class was, was exploited in one way or another. So when, when he and his family are free to work without oppression. And I think it's interesting also that he says that uh, by contrast, so the progressive and <laughs> the progressives, the progressive class, how he defines them, 
for them, for the proletariat, the, the ideal future is the future without work. No? So it's the state of leisure, of consumerism, of abundance, and so on. And he says that this principle of progress oriented toward the future of plentitude without work and so on is the underlying ethos of all modernity. So whether socialist or capitalist. So ultimately the only difference he says between the socialism and capitalism is in the content of progress, right? So, so uh, how, how, how is this uh, state of plentitude achieved? We are, uh, we are to say so engagement of artificial intelligence or you know other other forms of let's say re redistribution and uh, so uh, so it's uh, it's a quite uh, quite um, 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 uh, let's say for me it was uh, it was a really striking uh, figure and a kind of a striking effort by a person who uh, was also to say so uh, somebody who uh, who operated let's say in uh, um, in the in the kind of urban culture and in the in the context of uh, of high art uh, 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 his entire life so so i think that uh, that um, uh, you know if if we begin to talk about the kind of cyclicality here right mm -hmm. so i think obviously we are also talking about um, you know, um, uh, material cycles about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, closing um, um, uh, energy loops about the kind of no waste culture. And, uh, you know, all those uh, experiences that we could say f f um, um, traditional countryside <laughs> could <laughs> handle without any problem whatsoever, yeah. right? And I think to 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 recover those uh, uh, experiences, I mean, we cannot essentially recover them because we live in urban societies that are at vastly different scales. And I think we, we are essentially, I believe, faced with a new problem, right? <laughs> that, <laughs> That uh, you know that that needs to be uh, uh, creatively addressed, but uh, but certainly, let's say those those historical experiences uh, are uh, you know are are uh, are important. And I I also like like Berger. I mean, in in a, in a lot of my work, let's say countryside uh, is present as a, as really as a source of um, a source of you know. I think um, learning, you know, source of learning. Yeah. Although we 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 also understand now that uh, urbanization is a process which is not limited to cities. So mm -hmm. it, it is not so that that um, um, uh, you know uh, villages and agrarian landscapes are are untouched. I mean, on the contrary, right? So, and I think this is also one of the one of the points that uh, that Berger makes, right? So, mm -hmm. I think that is kind of a um, uh, let's say a, a silent uh, transformation of um, uh, life. I think uh, uh, anywhere through. Um, uh, through this, uh, um, um, let's say, industrial forms of economy is 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 uh, is probably, uh, uh, I think, a kind of a, a widespread European reality, right? So, to kind of searching for the for the remaining spots of the rural, I think, is is really, a, <laughs> you know, is is a kind of a let's say, um, you know could become a kind of a special special obsession <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes well this this brings us to the next um and our last term which is domestic um, um so i was um i was actually wondering while we were discussing um this term previously on how to relate um the idea of domestic to home, which which was maybe something that you were very much attached to as, as a concept, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so, but firstly, just to, to, to get back really to the term of domestic, I, I really wanted to 
to to address something which um, um, is is important to me as well, and 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 goes back to the movement of arts and crafts, right? Mm -hmm. um, which actually emerged rather into emerged in the countryside rather than in the cities, basically, mm -hmm. um, led by by figures such as uh, Morris. Uh, who are actually not against the use of machines, but they um, they further the division of labor, a system designed which to to increase actually efficiency, you know, and to increase production, um, uh, and which broke all the manufacturing tasks into small separate tasks in, in this linearity, which we call today lean, you know, lean management, which is a line mm -hmm. where everything has to function in line, actually um, meant that the individuals had a very weak relationship to the result of what they were actually doing, about their work, about their labor. And this was basically, in his eyes, the wrong direction. Um, Maybe his his, mm -hmm. his way of thinking is is still very very contemporary, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, more and more, even in intellectual services, um, um, which are done by by people that are academics, basically. So not only you know the, the, the ones that cannot go to universities, but even the ones that do. Um, uh, are taught actually at universities suddenly belong to to a line of work where their work is just a little piece of a much bigger one and they can be replaced at any time mm -hmm. and so and and this is something which also socially speaking and not only environmentally speaking is a huge problem because it de it it de it 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 um um, de-responsabilize, I don't know how you say that, de responsabilize yeah. you know, the, the individual. Mm -hmm. um, so whether in arts and crafts, you know, you, you had this, you know, idea of a, of a total interior, of a design which would address all different disciplines. So you had this cross-disciplinarity already very mm -hmm. much present, mm -hmm. where they would uh, be able to revolutionize domestic, domestic spaces and, and give room for the first time also to mm -hmm. women, actually, mm -hmm. to, to, to be part of this design process. So not only consuming in some way, but also designing it for their mm -hmm. own purposes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is maybe something which um, is, is a movement. It, it's, a, it's belonging to modernity in some way. But maybe different type of modernity, a sort of organic modernity. I don't know how how I would call it, mm -hmm. um, which would rather also belong to to protagonists such as Aline Gray or you know other mm -hmm. other figures and designers that mm -hmm. um, certainly never gave up actually trying to to join bo both the idea of abstraction in design and the crafts. Mm -hmm. These were not meant to be opposed, never. No. Of course, and uh, so uh, so um, I uh, I I think since we are speaking about the domestic right, and 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 we are also um, you know we are we are also architects, of course, and. Uh, and I think these uh, these questions are somehow, you know, following us and looming, you know. But let's say both through through our uh, our work, our own biographies. Life. So, <laughs> so I think it's uh, it's interesting, perhaps, to 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 bring it this for the moment to to the personal sphere because uh, uh, architects are uh, and and certainly, let's say, those of our generation. I mean. I think that there is a kind of a, a among all, all of our friends, let's say Berlachi friends, or th those that I I am in contact with. I mean, th those people have have in a way uh, tried to design and build their own home, right? And very much along those ideas of kind of believing in um, 
and also in a way loving that kind of uh, uh, creativity and ability to to shape one's own space no and i think that that um, um, i mean certainly you know we live in in cities that are that are expensive right? luxembourg and zurich and uh, i think that the kind of uh, uh, reality of of real estate and i mean this is again where 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 leonor's work uh, i think hits a kind of a, a interesting point right so i think that the the uh, i would say the 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 realities of real estate um, um, market uh, are in fact um, i would say um, pushing away the, the kind of uh, um, uh, either, uh, um, you know, the, the possibility now of, of home ownership, I think, for many people, and then ultimately the, the freedom of uh, changing. I mean, this is not, not only the real estate, but also the, um, let's say, the, 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 the various uh, regulations uh, around the home building, which I think in the, in the Western Europe are, are rather stifling, you know. So, so let's say this kind of, a, I think, a playful need of, of shaping and building one, one on, one's own home is, is, is more and more, uh, uh, you know, out of reach, I think, for, for most urbanites that I know, right? And I think we, as, as architects, we are a kind of a, uh, privileged kind. <laughs> let's say a small party of, of those who are who are trying to go against that specific sure. reality, right? So 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 uh, so I think you know if I mean perhaps you you would like to say I, I know that you uh, you also you know designed and, and, and built your own house. I mean are there are there specific are there some some interesting experiences? I mean, we, we are still in the process. I can tell you a lot about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I, I think it's um, of course it's a it's a great privilege. It's an incredible privilege if you can start to think about your home, whether you are an architect or not. Actually, it's um it's something actually that m many people just don't have the opportunity to do so. Um, um, but uh, indeed, I mean, um, while doing so for once, for ourselves, for, for our family, um, we had, uh, you know, these very, you know, essential um, questions on, on what would we expect from our house, you know. And since we designed our house quite late, you know, as, you know, as an architect, because most of our friends, I don't know, but many of them, you know, managed in some way to do it a little earlier. <laughs> um, we had, we had a, actually this opportunity to live already a lot, you know, many years in different things. We had moved so many times, you know, we, uh, so our, our question basically, what, what, what is our home? What, what will be this kind of point that we would like to create for our family? Um, what, what would it need to, who would it need to serve and um, so and actually we realized over the design process that we were constantly changing and shifting rooms <laughs> um, so we realized that actually it's almost unforeseeable what what the needs are and um, so these the, we need we needed flexibility mm -hmm. and we also needed a space um spaces which we would like to share also collectively so that was something which really yeah. came came up so instead of having very big private rooms at some point we, we we thought maybe it's also nice to have rooms actually together um in order to to cultivate this idea of exchange being together playing together you know listening or watching movies um, together so this is these are all concerns which which finally um made up our quest for very simple design in the end. So we made a very normal house, <laughs> um, very normal, but of course, trying um, to deal with these issues of, of circularity and materials, you know, mm -hmm. how to keep the, the things in the loop, you know, as long as possible. I mean, all that was, was really 
part of our process. I, I don't know. <laughs> I would like to share it with you actually in real time. Yeah, so. it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I think that uh, that um, um, you know one one very very obvious uh, you know I mean point about craft. I think that that Leonor also underlines in in many of her works in, in working with, with, with local craftsmen and so on. And uh, I think that this, uh, uh, at least, I mean, you know, here in our, our experiences, I mean, this, this is also an almost utopian undertaking because, uh, uh, I mean, I think it makes sense in the context of high art, but in the context even of, of architects building their own house, it's almost completely impossible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, uh, 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 you know, even even though we would be very very committed to it, but uh, uh, you know, we've we've built uh, small uh, you know small projects, uh, for instance, in 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 Belgrade and in Serbia where I come from, and and now uh, um, in Switzerland and, and perhaps also in the Netherlands and in each also we lived for a, for a while in Singapore and I think in each of these countries we are aware in, in very different ways how those craft um, knowledge or experiences uh, to say so have, have moved into kind of highly specialized areas and are, are completely out of reach for mm -hmm. uh, let's say everyday use, right? So let's say I think as as returning to say craft into the domestic sphere, I'm afraid has become impossible, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that uh, uh, you know this is this is a, 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 a kind of a linking back to William Morris, right? So it's a kind of a it's a kind of a dream. You know, or to or to Shinto shrine, right? It's a kind of a dream that essentially we are unable to realize, right? Either for the for the lack of knowledge, you know, which which is fact, or or you know, for the lack of money, or you know, for the kind of regulations working against uh, against you, or or you know, time is a problem. You know, but one one should have the luxury of time in order to be able, and so on. And uh, I think we, we have also discovered, I mean, a team indeed, a team of, of recycling as a, as a very potent team that uh, I wouldn't have, have, you know, thought back then or, you know, it, it perhaps, of course, we, we spoke also in the bear market, you know, 20 years ago about recycling, but I think we have discovered it really through the, the kind of uh, effort of doing something, right? And I think that, uh, that uh, uh, this kind of uh, now pleasure of really salvaging something from, from being thrown away has, has become very important. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, is, this is also the kind of, the kind of dialogue, you know, with, with Leonor. I'm not sure if Leonor is... is uh, is, is listening with us tonight but it, it has been a great pleasure and you know to 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 engage yep. with each other and with her work yeah yes 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 thank you Milica. I, I I think we have to stop now on these beautiful words and uh, um, we yeah we basically thank Leonor for her work her contribution and all the instigations that <laughs> Um, followed and uh, this opportunity that we had to reconnect uh, through this talk and uh, all the previous meetings um, which was actually also um, made possible by Caroline Hoffmann of Mudam who had this idea actually to, to, to make this conversation possible as well so I I, I think that we have now to, to stop this session. Mm -hmm. um, so I say goodbye um, to you, to your family. Thank you so much. All my best greetings. Actually. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. And thank you, Dora. It was really lovely <laughs> to, to share this uh, time with you. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.